Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Juggernaut Books and the Sandeep and Gitanjali Mani Foundation, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration of our brilliant author, Manu S. Pillai's book, Rebel Sultans. In this jewel of a book, Manu tells the story of the medieval Deccan from the time that Alauddin Khilji raids the south to the rise of Shivaji. Spanning 400 years, Rebel Sultans takes us through the world of the Bahmani Sultanate and Vijayanagar, and then the successor Sultanates to the Bahmanis, Ahmednagar, Bijapur, and Golconda. It is full of the most interesting stories from the Raya of Vijayanagar, who asks the king of Bijapur to kiss his foot, to the spoilt son of the chief minister of Golconda, who throws up all over the Sultan's throne, presumably after a night of hard partying. Through the book, we get to know, among other characters, the courageous warrior queen, Chand Bibi, Mughal emperor Jahangir's sworn enemy, Malik Ambar, and perhaps the most extraordinary prince of the Deccan, the broad-minded Ibrahim Adil Shah II, a Muslim who called himself the son of Guru Ganpati and the pure Saraswati. Manu shows us an, I Manu shows us an India that was welcoming to people who were different from European traders and doctors, even snipers, to Africans who scaled the heights of power and made this land their own. In fact, he even tells us of a black queen of the Deccan. He liberates the history of the Deccan from narrow and frankly suffocating labels of Hindu and Muslim, and brings nuance to questions of violence and temple destruction, for instance. But most importantly, Manu frees us from the grip of histories that revolve around the north of India and directs our attention south of the Vindhyas. To know India, we must know the Deccan, Manu writes. Rebel Sultans has been, has, received, has been received with great acclaim and admiration, most encouragingly from lay readers. But I only want to draw your attention to one review from the Hindu, which says, Rebel Sultans is the much needed bridge between the isolated world of academia and wider public audience. This, ladies and gentlemen, is testament to how Manu is not just a superb storyteller, but combines this gift of his with deep, thorough research. Rebel Sultans is actually Manu's second book, and he is not yet 30. His first was the much-loved bestseller, The Ivory Throne, for which he was awarded the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puruskar. Manu writes a weekly column for Mint, one which is consistently engaging and thought-provoking, and he is also enrolled as a PhD student at King's College London. Sometimes I wonder if Manu has more than just 24 hours in his day. Before this, Manu was chief of staff to Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who is our chief guest for this evening. Dr. Tharoor is a second-term Lok Sabha MP from Thiruvananthapuram. He is also the author of 17 books, his last two being Why I Am a Hindu and An Era of Darkness. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us today. The conversation between Manu and Dr. Tharoor will be moderated by Ms. Ira Mukhoti, whose Daughters of the Sun on the Women of the Mughal Empire is one of our favorite books published this year. Ms. Mukhoti is working on a biography of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, her third book, which we're eagerly looking forward to. Thank you so much, Ms. Mukhoti, for being with us today. I'd now like to invite Dr. Tharoor, Manu, and Ms. Mukhoti onto the stage. One last thing, please do make sure your phones are on silent. Hello, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see such a crowd for narrative history. Who would have thought? Uh, before we begin, can I invite Dr. Tharoor to say a few words, please? Oh, from there. That mic is not good. All right. Great. Well, uh, yeah, actually, this should be a conversation anyway. No, I'm, I'm delighted, obviously, to be asked to have the first word simply because I've known Manu as he was reminding me, for seven of his 28 years on this planet. And rather closely, because Manu has been working uh, 
uh, on and off with me. I don't mean that he works on and off. He works absolutely madly and intensely, and he's, uh, I think, the, the, as much of a workaholic as I am. So absolutely no problem with that. But on and off in the sense that he would do a stint with me, go off and write a book, come back and do another stint with me, write a book, and I'm hoping that now this one is out, he'll come back and do another stint with me, God willing, in some new incarnation. But in any case, uh, he, it's, been a, it's been a very, very close uh, friendship over, the, over this, these seven years in which he has worked uh, intensely on, on, on my preoccupations, professional, political, and indeed uh, scholarly and, and literary. But above all, in that process, I think has demonstrated an opportunity to grow his own range of interests and find himself uh, as a human being, as a thinker, and as a writer. Um, I always knew one who could write. Uh, because he ghosted so many of my emails, for one thing. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, I really discovered how well he could write when I finally sat down uh, three years ago, two and a half years ago, to all 600, 700 pages of The Ivory Throne. Because I remember it was after a rather exhausting day's work that I began it. And I sat down in my most comfortable chair, and I thought, yeah, this looks like very dense stuff. Maybe I'll read for about half an hour and then push off to bed. And 200 pages later, completely enthralled, uh, taken up by the absolute extraordinary flow of his narrative, the lucidity of his writing, his magnificent ability to evoke portraits of a time and of a people long gone. Um, I found that if I didn't put the book down, I was going to be reading to dawn. And I finally did and came back and, 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 and just couldn't resist uh, coming back to the book the very next day and, and finishing it. And in just a few installments of intense reading, so compelling was the writing. And as Barth has already said, I was muttering that he took away my, my best points. Uh, what is particularly interesting about Manu's writing is that he manages to combine an extraordinary depth of scholarship. Uh, I think this book, which is a pretty short book, it's one third the length of his previous book, but this book has about 50 pages of footnotes. So you can see he's done an enormous amount of reading and, and, and citation. At the same time, there is a very, very broad range of, of understanding and, and a broad range of subjects that's covered. It's not just in-depth reading into narrow aspects, but a very, very broad uh, aspects. And he combines both of those talents with, or skills, I suppose they are, with a talent for writing in a very accessible way. There must be scholars who are as thorough as Manu, and there must be scholars who know as much as he does, but very few, I think, who can put the two, two together in prose of such readability, lucidity, eloquence, and wit, because there's a lot of humor he tosses in as well. Uh, and so the result is that you read Manu with a certain kind of pleasure that very few histories give you. And I think he is well on the way to reinventing Indian popular history writing uh, for the 21st century. And I say this... I say this with, with, with utter confidence because both these books are pretty magisterial efforts and they've been produced with great speed. You know, when I remember when I first published uh, a book, a friend of mine sent me a New Yorker cartoon from the 1950s, which is a, a classic. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a picture of a typewriter, those were the days, right? Floating in, on a life buoy uh, with one page uh, stuck in it, rolled up. And there's this writer whose hand is struggling to reach that life boy, and in that one page is typed the words second novel, you know? Uh, it's such a challenge. That first one, you put everything into, you put your life and soul, your ideas. When you write a first book, you never really know whether you'll ever write a second. First of all, you, you don't even know if the first one will be published, how it'll be received, whether there'll be a market for a second, whether you'll have the ability, the talent, the time, the energy left to do the second. So that second book is actually in many ways a bigger challenge than the first. And Manu has produced a second book in record time, in two years flat, and he's done it uh, with all the same qualities, though at one third the length uh, of the first one. Uh, it is 
an enormous amount of, of material that he's digested, a lot of scholarship, a broad sweeping swathe of history that he covers, and he does so, I must say, in a very light and deaf style. So people who haven't studied history or who didn't like history when they studied it at school, which unfortunately I find is the case with many of my friends who remember their history lessons uh, without much fondness, they will find in this book um, a lot to delight them. Um, there will be, I'm sure, issues that people pick bones with Manu about, and Ira Mukherjee herself has written about some of this period. I thought, for instance, that you gave very much short shrift to Chand Bibi. She barely gets two pages in your treatment, and Ira will tell you more about that. Uh, but, uh, but having said that, uh, what there is is utterly delightful, and, uh, and I think it's a mark as well of how much you enjoy a book when it leaves your appetite whetted for more that you wish he had actually applied these same talents that I've summarized to more bits, more of these walk-on characters who appear for a page or two or a paragraph or two and disappear, and you wish you knew more about them because he makes them sound so good. So, Manu, Look I must notes. say... Hmm? Look at the footnotes. I did. There's, there's more I did, and I must say, actually, that's another bone I want to pick with you. Some of those footnotes should have been in the body of the book because they're so interesting Where's in themselves. Where's my editor? Where's my editor? <laughs> they are so interesting in themselves that um, I felt, unless you're a wonk like me who will plow through footnotes and read them in detail, uh, you may actually miss some genuine nuggets. And... Um, you know, Parth, uh, let me tell you what I did when my editors tried to do that to me in Era of Darkness. I said the footnote should only be pure references to sources. Any substantive footnote, which, is, which has got a nugget of information or an anecdote or some insight, as many of his footnotes do, I insist should appear on the same page as the text. So that then, even if the editor sees, says it's too clunky in the text, it's got to be on the page, I mean, it's got to be on a footnote, let the footnote be on the same page so people are forced to look and see the additional material. Whereas for you to turn back every time to, you know, the 50-page collection of footnotes at the end is an imposition. So there's my second quarrel. But I will refuse to let these two minor cavils spoil my appreciation of what is a wonderful book, beautifully produced by Jagannath. The illustrations through the book as well, so it makes it all the more interesting to look at. But I wanted to end my appreciation by telling you, Manu, that I think you really, really have done uh, an extraordinary job. A second act is a hard one. Ivory uh, Throne was a very hard act to follow. Because it was so good, there's always the fear that some critics would say, oh, is this, he was, is this the best he was capable of, the author of The Ivory Throne? But you've actually written, in some ways, a more compact, more effectively focused, more manageable book. Well done. Um, I look forward to your third. Uh, and I want to say that uh, for all the qualities that I've summarized, the scholarship, the, the range, the, um, the power of synthesis, and the writing, uh, I thought there was a wonderful couple of lines he quotes from a verse either of Ibrahim II, he doesn't say, or that Ibrahim II liked to recite, where he talks about someone upon whom the goddess of learning Saraswati has smiled. You are that person on whom Saraswati has smiled. You. God you. bless you. May she smile on you for many, many more books to come. Thank you, sir. Dr. Zaru is a very hard act to follow, but um, I would like Tell to thank him it, yes. very much. And as he said, seven years is a very long time. So uh, although I would like to embrace all these wonderful qualities he's enumerated, I should also warn you that uh, it might come with a little bit of bias and affection cultivated, cultivated over the last seven years. Ira, on, on to you. Yes. Can I ask everyone to switch off uh, their mobile phones or put it on silent because it's very disturbing <laughs> and interrupts the flow? Um, so we going to there seem to be two empty seats. I feel so bad for all the people standing at the back. That's right. <clears throat> so we're going to have a conversation uh, between Manu and Dr. Tharoor, and at the end there will be time for question and answer session. So if there are things that come up during the talk that you want to uh, bring up later, please make a note of it, and we will be addressing questions. So I want to get right into the, uh, the meat of the matter, uh, uh, Manu. And uh, if you will all you know, look at the cover here. There's a little line which seems quite innocuous, but nothing is innocuous in a cover like this. It says, the Deccan from Khilji to Shivaji. So for us northerners, you know, in our arrogance or in our ignorance maybe, which postures as arrogance, these are two familiar names, you know. Oh yes, Khilji, the marauder from the north, and Shivaji, right? The great savior of the Hindu state. 
But in between these two great figures that we are, we are aware of are 400 years, which at least to me and I think to many of us here, uh, we were completely unaware of. It's to misquote uh, Naipaul terribly, it's an area of darkness. Uh, and one which we are really not uh, at all familiar with is what I thought. But when you read the book, this is a, a positively riotous array of characters that Manu creates for us. And through this, he creates a world of such complexity and so much texture and so much fluidity and intercultural exchange that it completely challenges this binary notion that we have of a Muslim versus Hindu story. It also, I feel, challenges us in our notion of what is Indianness. Who is an Indian? What constitutes a real Indian in today's climate? So some of these thoughts, Manu, can you take that forward and tell us how you came about with this? Since you mentioned Indianness first, the back of the cover, which you can't really see here, <laughs> That's uh, right. has a much darker man and the front has a slightly fairer man. And the reason we chose this cover was because it does encapsulate the world of the Deccan fairly well. Because the man sitting on this elephant in the front is the Adil Shah of Bijapur, who is, you know, this part Persian, part Maharashtrian uh, king, whose court includes, you know, cultural elements and influences from both these uh, uh, genealogical streams to which he belongs. And at the back is an African general called Iklas Khan, who, you know, most people don't realize, most people in Maharashtra, where I grew up, don't realize that Maharashtra had a huge African presence where thousands of Africans uh, landed up year after year. So when Malik Ambar, who you mentioned, uh, showed up in the Deccan, he discovered that he was one of a thousand African military slaves purchased by the Peshwa of Ahmednagar. And the Peshwa himself was black, who had come to Ahmednagar as a slave himself, and then eventually built up and uh, become more powerful and become the chief minister of Ahmednagar, where he eventually lost his head, which was also something that happened a great deal in the Deccan. On your question about why Khilji to Shivaji, we again had a little bit of a trick there with that subtitle. Part came up which is that because Indian history is so focused on North India, the idea of the book was to extract the Deccan from the North Indian narrative and look at it on its own terms. However, hello, hello, yeah. So um, what was I saying? Yeah, so the fact is that although the Deccan is normally viewed from the prism of this North Indian uh, narrative and so on, we did realize that most people only understand North Indian concepts. So you need a Shivaji because that's what everybody recognizes, and you need a Kilji because everybody understands Kilji. So we needed this clever little subtitle. But the other thing is this period also forms a, a, a very compact uh, historical zone in its own right, because what, when Kilji comes to the south, what he destroys is all the earlier uh, Hindu dynasties that ruled there, the Hoysalas, the Kakatiyas, the Yadavas. So that age is coming to a close, and you have Islam coming in a, in a very different way into the Deccan, into peninsula India. And Shivaji, again, marks the beginning of a new chapter, because he comes up with a new vision and a new ideology and a new you know, uh, um, idea about power itself, about how he wants to articulate his power, how he wants a state to be represented, and so on. So again, you have a break there. And what I discovered was the period in between is what is neglected massively. You have these fascinating characters, fascinating men and women, and you weave history through these men and women, and you realize that you know, though their contexts were different, they as people were not very different from us. Their impulses were the same. The way they responded to situations was the same. And once I found these stories, I realized why aren't people talking about them? And they need to be brought back to light. They need to be given a larger audience. And there was a lot of academic work. There was a lot in the seminar circuit, as it were. Uh, but nothing for a, for a lay audience, nothing. Growing up in Pune, I didn't really know about the Persian, half Persian Adil Shahs. I didn't know about African queens in a, what is now a tier two city called Ahmednagar. I didn't know that the Qutub Shahs were Shias who sort of had to conceal it for a while and then eventually uh, came into their own and decided to sort of flaunt their Shia hood and uh, once got so powerful that they were able to say no to the Shah of Iran when the Shah of Iran asked for a bride from their, their royal family. So all these stories, came together and I decided that, you know, in a time when there is this black and whiteization of Indian history, where everything is Muslim versus Hindu, and everything is limited to these very narrow, uh, these very narrow de definitions, that, you know, a book like this would remind people that Indian history is a little more complicated, it has more nuance, and it's not really black and white, but really a mosaic of very many colors that all come together and prove that to be Indian is to be many things all at once. Absolutely. And Dr. Thiru, you've written a book? Thank you. You've just written a book on what it means for you to be a Hindu. So can you tie that in with some of the... Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think that what Manu has done is actually recapture um, the narrative from these binaries that some people are dangerously trying to get us into. 
And uh, to begin with, the Deccan, as he says, was very much um, a mirror of India, though for many Indians it was a mirror of the world, and that, that was a very interesting juxtaposition. You have all these diverse ethnic uh, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, religious uh, mixes going on at the same time, best of all embodied in this one King Ibrahim who is uh, simultaneously everything, it seems. Uh, he seems to be Sunni, Shia, Hindu, uh, <laughs> and God knows what else, uh, all in one uh, rather complicated package. Uh, but what's interesting uh, is that Manu points out that a lot of these things cannot be reduced to battles between one a religiously identified group and another. You have Muslims attacking Muslims, Hindus attacking Hindus, Hindus serving Muslims and attacking other Hindus, Muslims serving Hindus and attacking other Muslims, etc., etc. So these were the times. I mean, it was a rather bloodthirsty and violent era in many, many uh, uh, periods, though punctuated by great periods of cultural efflorescence and art and culture and music and food and God knows what else. But it certainly wasn't divisible into simple monolithics. And that, I think, has been a very useful understanding, so, so buttressed by anecdote after anecdote, that no one can read the book by and go away thinking that it's even possible to speak of this period in purely Hindu versus Muslim terms. Absolutely. Uh, Manu, before we go into the more glamorous uh, later kingdoms, can we have a short, uh, you know, uh, give us a short aperçu of the Kakatayas and their amazing uh, egalitarian sort of society where there was no boundary of caste and class, which even so many centuries later today is something truly astonishing. Yeah, we, again, since we were talking about Dr. Thuru's book on Hinduism and the um, idea that, you know, for example, caste, as you mentioned, with the Kakatayas, the Kakatiyas complicate the idea of caste that we've learned from our textbooks about Brahmins and Kshatriyas and Vaishyas and Shudras, because you find that a lot of the nobility of the Kakatiyas were actually Shudras. The Kakatiya kings themselves, except for one of them, happily embraced their Shudra status and never made any efforts to claim to be anything better than, you know, uh, one from among the people. Uh, you have this, in my first book, I talk about how Indian kings were often anxious to claim Kshatriyahood one way or the other. And one of the most inventive techniques was to construct a golden cow, go in into the mouth of the cow, sit inside while Brahmins pelted the cow with, uh, you know, milk and honey and flowers or whatever, and chanted mantras of birth. Uh, and then the king emerges from under the tail of the cow and he's reborn as a Kshatriya king. So Indian kings, whether it's Shivaji, whether it was Matanda Varma of Travancore, the Nayaka of Madurai, who essentially, by the way, jumped into the Brahmin priest's wife's lap, wailing like a baby to complete the act. Uh, the Kakatiyas were a complete contrast because they really didn't care. They were quite happy being who they were. They were from the people. They were very much part of the agrarian communities that existed there. And that was the world into which Khilji and the, the Islamic Sultanates march. And although there was obviously bigotry, there was violence, and violence was often justified in the name of religion, justification is merely one half of the reality. We often find that what texts pr project is not necessarily reality. Uh, on Twitter, for example, a lot of criticism from trolls that I got is about this 1565 battle of Talikota, where Vijayanagar is destroyed. And they, it's always presented as a Hindu empire being destroyed by a group of Muslim sultans. Now, but if you look at the detail, you'll find that it's actually much more complicated. Because the king of Vijayanagar, who was fighting that battle, Ramaraya, began his career with, in the court of the Qutub Shah of Golconda. The Qutub Shah, who was at that battle, spent his teenage growing up here, seven years, in Vijayanagar, where he Teluguized, Teluguized his name from Ibrahim to Malik Brahma, learned the Telugu language, acquired a local Hindu wife, and patronized poetry on the Mahabharata. Also present was Ali, uh, Ali Adil Shah at this battle, who had been adopted by Ramaraya's wife as her son. So none of, And there were 6,000 Marathas there, by the way, since we're also talking about Shivaji. And the 6,000 Marathas were on the side of the sultans. Whereas on the side of Vijayanagar, there was a character called Ainun Mul Ginali, who often on Twitter, people sort of pull out these, uh, these screenshots from Google Books saying, Ainun Mul Ginali defected at the battle and went over. There's no proof of this. Where Ainun Mul Ginali appears in the inscriptional record, he's actually donating land to 80 Brahmins. So I don't know where some of these stories come up from, but you realize that the details again prove that these basic concepts that we've taken as natural or taken as given can all be challenged, can all be questioned, and can all be put to the side when you start looking, scratching under the surface and discovering that India's story and the Deccan story wasn't purely about black and white and, and, and religion. Uh, 
That's really a, a really fascinating point. And Dr. Theroux, have you found in your writings uh, this uh, attempt that there always seems to be of a Brahminical revision of history? So this egalitarian kingdom, we nobody, I think, in this room would have heard about. So what is it that always brings us back to the great Brahmin traditions and the great Brahmin kingdoms, and we only see history through that particular filter? Well, I think it's partly a reflection of today, isn't it? I mean, in many ways, um, a lot of history says as much about the present as it does about the past it's trying to depict. And the past is often depicted through the lens of a certain view of the, of the, pre of the, of the, of the, of the, of the present. So you find um, a lot of British historians recapturing this period and writing uh, of Hindu versus Muslim because it suited the entire mentality that gave us the divide and rule policy in the British Raj. Uh, if you basically even devote history, your study of history, to showing that Hindus and Muslims were irretrievably in different and hostile camps, you're in a better position to encourage them not to make common cause against the British in the present day. Now, I'm not suggesting it was always as crude and blatant as that, but I think it's a fair criticism of some of the historians you cite, like Sewell and so on, uh, because that was, at the very least, there was a synchrony between British imperial policy on the one hand and the tenor of these analyses on the other. It's actually modern Indian historians, whether working on Indian campuses or on American campuses and British campuses, but modern Indian historians since the advent of the secular state who have actually been digging up so much evidence of the kinds of uh, uh, fluidity and interpenetration Manu talks about in the Deccan, whether it's all the examples he's just given, whether it's, whether it's uh, Rajput generals fighting for Mughal monarchs, I mean, you know, who forgets Man Singh and Jai Singh and so on, uh, we, we seem to define uh, an era, an empire, a kingdom, a state by the religious identity of its ruler without actually paying attention to who the cutting edge was. I mean, Rana Pratap in the Battle of Haldigati faced a Rajput general, he didn't face a Muslim general. Uh, these are things that we completely forget when we get into these little debates. So as far as I'm concerned, history is replete with this. Manu and I happen to agree completely on this. And, and um, I'm just glad that he's established this once again in new territory, literally, because the Deccan hasn't been written about very much. You mm -hmm. know, I studied history in Bombay, Calcutta, and Delhi, and I didn't know half the things that he's written about because it never came up in my textbooks. There's an African dynasty that ruled briefly in Bengal, for example. People who live in Uttar Pradesh don't realize that in Jaunpur there was an African dynasty that ruled in the 14th century, 14th, 15th century. So, you know, even the presence of Africans alone, even Razia Sultan was murdered partly because she had an African mother. This African chapter is one of the most fascinating. And technically, Malikamba deserves a book in his own right, but there isn't enough material. For example, you mentioned Chan Bibi as well. There's, there's a sort of paucity of material. So what you have is very little. And then you have some concocted material that you can find, some sort of glossy uh, bits that were added later. But the actual you know, solid evidence is a little limited on these characters. And because they haven't been touched very much, even by modern historians, trying to sort of retrieve them from the past becomes even more of a, a challenge. Can we talk a little bit more about that, about the sources and how you uh, get to the findings you have? Because, you know, things are changing so fast, really, in the last uh, 20 years almost, right, with all this narrative history and, you know, Indians coming to write history again. And there's a realization somehow now that India was perhaps not as ahistorical as, uh, you know, we thought, and it's just differently historical. Uh, it's certainly something that I've begun to find in the work that I've done. Is it something that you would agree with? Are there any interesting documents that you found which ordinarily would have been uh, put aside and cast aside as ir irrelevant or, you know, um, not important enough, let's say. With um, Indian uh, history is that often, again, in the age of Twitter, people have access to some sources, but you don't always know how to read those sources. So, for instance, uh, I when Vijayanagar conquered uh, Madurai, there was this uh, poem produced called Madurai Vijay by a lady from the, from the Vijayanagar royal family. And it, it's a, it, if you read it, you know, off the surface, just read the text. You're horrified by the things it says. Blood of Brahmins in the streets, blood of cows reddening the rivers, the temples, there's termites everywhere, the, all the pujas have stopped, Brahmins are being slaughtered, la la la. But then the thing is, a scholar, so people on Twitter will pull this out saying, look at this, evidence that the Muslims were violent. Of course they were violent, they were Muslim kings, so they didn't want pujas in the temple. That is that, nobody's denying it. But a historian looks at a text in a different way, which is that, A, you look at who wrote the text, what language was the text written in, and what was the intended audience. In Madhura Vijayam, it's a woman related to the Vijayanagar royal family, so she has an agenda, she has something in this game. 
It was written in the Sanskrit language, which means it wasn't for your average Tamil peasant. It was for the Tamil elite. And why was it written? Now you see, the, they're expelling the Muslim rulers from Madurai, but Vijayanagar isn't Tamil either. Tamil Nadu's already got its Pandyas and Cholas and great dynasties that were prominent there. So to legitimize themselves, to make Vijayanagar, which is this Kannada Telugu enterprise, look less foreign, you make the previous rulers look more foreign. Which is why eventually they had rebellions in the Tamil territories, because the, 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 the peasants there said, look, we don't want this sort of rule from a faraway capital in, in, in a Kannadiga Telugu court. And we're going to therefore, uh, and Vijayanagar had to concede autonomy. Then you come to the Shiva Bharata, which was a, a poem that Shivaji himself uh, you know, had commissioned by Parmananda. Uh, and, and, and the thing with this poem is that again it reveals so much about the way some people read the same text and other people approach the text. So if you look at some parts of the text, you'll see Shivaji is reborn. He's, he's, he's you know, God reborn on earth to deliver uh, the poor dharmic uh, forces from the clutch of the Mlechas, which is the Muslims and so on. But the same text refers to the Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar as a dharmatma. It praises Malik Ambar, who is a very devout Sunni Muslim, as brave as the sun is, you know, is how he, he's described in this text. When uh, Afzal Khan, which is a very popular and well-known episode, Afzal, Afzal Khan shows up to come and you know, sort of kill Shivaji, and Shivaji ends up killing him. Uh, if you look at the people accompanying Afzal Khan, if it's only Afzal Khan and Shivaji, you have again a Muslim-Hindu uh, battle playing out. But if you look at the people coming with Afzal Khan, Ghorpade, Ghatke, Pingle, there are Brahmins, there's, there's Hindu names, Marathas coming with Afzal Khan. On, on Shivaji's side, you have Siddhi Ibrahim, again, you know, described in, in flattering, glowing terms. So these texts, again, depends on how you approach it, which part you approach, and then how you, you present your, your findings. Sure, and you uh, mentioned, uh, you know, violence is obviously a place where there was a lot of violence, as there is throughout history. Uh, and violence is an incendiary subject, per se. Uh, but it's also something from which we can learn a great deal. You know, the English, for example, have been past masters at manipulating their image vis-a-vis -vis, um, violence. And Dr. Tharuvri, I remember reading your first book, An Era of Darkness, and it making such an impression on me, because finally I understood that the English were terribly brutal and violent, and this was something which really we are not told about enough. Not because anybody wants to blame them for that, but you understand what happens, you know, retroactively and after the violence of 1857, for example, it, it kind of put things in perspective and you're be better able to understand that part of history. So, you know, when you're writing about violence as, as a historian, there's, a, there's an urge to self-censor to, you know, uh, to a certain amount because you're worried about how it's going to be perceived. What I liked about your book was that there was a certain almost effervescent joy about uh, talking about the violence, you know, and it's from both sides. <laughs> it's both sides. It's Muslim violence, it's Hindu violence, it's violence in between, it's against all sorts of people, and it's gruesome. So, you know, was it, did you particularly go out to say, okay, I am not going to censor myself about this sort of thing. Well, frankly, I was just fascinated with, I, with how creative people could get with violence. You have one character who throws a, a rival, sort of chops him up and throws him into biryani and tries to feed that biryani to the dead man's wife. So that's one story. Now, the thing is, take some of these with a pinch of salt because you can never verify how much of this is true. That biryani stories, probably required a lot of salt. I know. <laughs> The, the funny thing is, apparently it was offered to some elephants and the elephants didn't eat it, but we don't know whether the wife and kids actually did end up eating it. Uh, so that was that one case. Vijayanagar, you know, when the book came out, a fairly senior figure on Twitter, who you know, uh, said that, oh, you're trying to whitewash a tyrant, uh, you know, who, who, who's very violent and bloodthirsty. And the thing is, I don't understand why this bloodthirsty argument only comes out when the name sounds Muslim. Because if a Muslim king, if Ibrahim Adil Shah, who, you know, besides creating great art and worshipping Saraswati, happened to murder a brother and blind a regent, he wasn't the only one. There was an emperor of Vijayanagar who was murdered by his son. Then another sa brother came and murdered that one. Uh, you have uh, a sister, a queen in Vijayanagar being sort of uh, threatened by her own brothers and she writes to the Adil Shah saying, come rescue me and my son. Unfortunately, he doesn't because the brothers bribe him. So you have violence in Vijayanagar. You have violence with Shivaji as well. When he wants to conquer Javli, he sends a diplomatic uh, mission there, except that midway through the meeting, the diplomats get up and stab the, the ruler of Javli and take over. So violence wasn't, again, only one side of the uh, of, of this Hindu-Muslim equation. It was all over the place. And as I said, you can throw people into, I don't know, boiling, uh, you know, uh, oil, and you can turn them into biryani, and you can have them torn apart by elephants or eaten by tigers. It was fact, fact, quite fascinating that people found these creative ways to turn violence into a sort of 
form of entertainment, really. Yes, as I say, FFS enjoy in writing about the <laughs> cruelty. Dr. Thiru, what are your thoughts on opening the floodgates, as it were, or, you know, when talking about violence vis-a-vis -vis Indians, vis-a-vis -vis foreigners? How do you feel about that? I don't know. I actually tried not to take the violent bits quite too seriously. I mean, the, not because it didn't happen. I think Manu's right. Those were the times. Uh, but also because it was just part of the rich anecdotal material. I mean, a more fascinating story to me than the violent one was when uh, this uh, Vijayanagar king, uh, uh, speaking to or sending a message to the uh, residual uh, uh, sultan, who ought to have been, in theory, the person he had to pay some sort of allegiance to, invited him to come and kiss his foot. Uh, which Krishna Devaraya. Krishna Devaraya invited uh, Khan, um, which Kutub Shahi was he, that he had to come? It was the Adil Shah. The Adil Shah had to come and kiss his foot. And Adil Shah said, you know, I would not mind doing so, but I can't as a prince come to your sovereign territory. I mean, these kinds of diplomatic exchanges were far more fun than boiling people in oil. I mean, I thought that took much less imagination than inviting somebody to come and kiss your foot. I mean, that, that takes a certain talent for insult that I thought Indian politics could benefit from. And then, and then, and then uh, Krishna Devarai actually comes to, Ad to the Adil Shah's capital, saying, if you won't come to mine because you find it embarrassing to come into foreign territory, I'm happy to oblige. I'll come there. And then he comes there and offers his foot, and Adil Shah runs away, of course. Excellent. The unkissed foot. That could have been another title. <laughs> <laughs> or when they fight over a goldsmith's daughter. There's a goldsmith's daughter, and the, uh, the king of Vijayanagar is very anxious to have her in his harem. And then the, the sultan says, of course not. If she's in my territory, I'm going to have her. And then, you know, they, that leads to another little battle between them. And again, a lot of gold is to be exchanged and surrendered, and lots of people are embarrassed. <laughs> yes, and uh, what about the, the princess who people fought over, and then she ended up uh, converting uh, to Christianity and running off to Goa? That was actually... <laughs> I mean, you know... That one was actually fascinating because you actually have evidence here, or there's, there's a man who writes about this, uh, a contemporary who says that um, this, Vijay, this uh, Adil Shahi princess ends up in Goa because her father's uh, one of the rivals to the throne and he's trying very hard to regain the throne or you know, sort of uh, insist on his claim. So he intends for his daughter to be given in marriage either to the Vijayanagar king or to the Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar. So he's trying so to- again, religion was not a factor here. Yeah. yeah. Either they, Hindu they or They were trying to negotiate an alliance. And then in the middle of this, this princess starts a, a friendship with a local Christian woman who decides that among the other things they'll talk about, they will also talk about Jesus Christ. And then before you know it, the princess decides, I want to become a Christian because I'm presuming she got more freedom out of that. And one fine morning, they have this little plot where the, the governor of Goa, a huge procession of Christians on a Sunday, show up at this gentleman's house and he's taken aback about why these people have landed up. And there's a physical altercation. One group of women is trying to pull this, this uh, princess onto their side, her mother and the others. And the other women, the Christian women are trying to pull her onto that side. And they quickly take her away, and uh, including her uh, a little slave boy. During which you say all the hair came undone. All the hair came undone. And that's I didn't the, quite that know whether the, the hair was being pulled out by the tufts or merely that the no, braids undone. were loosened. Yeah. Ah, okay. it, was a, it was a way to describe that it was so indecent, the proceedings, that all the Portuguese women there, their hair came undone, and it was a very yeah, undignified affair. But in the end, she did convert. Her brothers also end up, ended up converting, and that family, from Mia Ali, they became Miele which was their Portuguese surname, and they continued there for a very, very long time in Goa. And of course, having been the object of a negotiation between a possible Muslim husband and a possible Hindu husband, she ended up with a Christian. So, you know, this is... <laughs> with, the, with the brother of the woman who converted her. So, there it's a go. nice, happy story there. Since you've been talking about women and since I was encouraged by Dr. Saru's opening words, um, let me ask you about the women in your book. Now, we do hear about Chan Bibi and we hear about the occasion uh, sometimes when the harem works in concert to get a favorite uh, you know, son or pretender to the throne. But there isn't a great deal, really, of a sense of achievement by the women themselves. Now, is that, a re is that because there's a scarcity of sources? Is it because there are sources which have been ignored? Is it because oral history is not uh, listened to in the Deccan? I mean, this, these are all the problems which I faced when I wrote my book. So what is your thoughts? It's frankly fa quite funny because this, is, this again goes back to your point about some good stories going into the footnotes. Because Chan Bibi, she, of course, people know about, but fewer people know about her mother, Kunza Humayun who was uh, regent in Ahmednagar for some time, till the nobles essentially came together and said, she's refusing to give up power. Her son came of age, but she wouldn't give up power. So nobles essentially had to sort of push her out and take over. But the funny thing is her son so resented the influence and power his mother had 
that in miniature paintings that survive of this time, with his, where she sits with his father, the father survives, but the son had the mother painted over. So she's been reduced to like blobs and blotches and uh, big smudges in these paintings because she was li quite literally wiped out of the scene. She's, they tried to sort of cut her out of history altogether. Chan Bibi, of course, survives because she led uh, the defense of Ahmednagar against the Mughals, so there's a little bit more romance to her story. She became something of a martyr. She was assassinated. But this lady, who then had to live the rest of her days in prison, essentially, uh, because it wasn't uh, some sort of a gruesome death, there was less romance to her story, and because she was written out, there was a problem there. Sometimes, of course, you find that women were also pawns. When Aunt Malikamba, for example, gets his daughter married to the, the, the puppet Nizam Shah he's installed in Ahmednagar, um, again, they, she was merely an instrument for him to, to sort of cement his own power. Uh, a previous uh, Nizam Shah in the 1590s had a black mother as well. He was quickly murdered because a set of Persian nobles did not like the fact that his mother was black. So you de do see some women present, you do see some racism as well. But on the whole, there is a scarcity of material. And because all the written sources do tend to privilege the men, some of it does uh, reflect in, the, in my narrative as well. Which reminds me, there was an, uh, an interview the obituaries editor of The Economist gave recently, where she talks about how even today, obituaries tend to be in The Economist largely of men, because the men dying now were active in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And in those days, there weren't that many women. So the people dying now, even in the 50s and 60s, there weren't enough famous women dying about whom you can now write. So. This is a problem that afflicts even okay. our times. And we, must we will be not aware construe of. that as an invitation will, to famous women to I, pass on and oblige the obituary. Yes. <laughs> Please okay. live, famous women. Uh, I think since we don't have a great deal of time uh, left, Manu, can we talk about Vijayanagar and the enduring appeal that it has for so many people and for poor Naipaul, who I'm uh, quoting a second time this evening. Uh, you know, he wrote so much about it and because of his recent death, it's been in the press. So what is it about this idea, this tenacious idea of a last Hindu kingdom, you know, standing up against the Muslims? Again, a, a legacy from the Kalu, really, because uh, the Vijayanagar's own sources don't quite picture, uh, paint a picture that shows them as staunch Hindus. Of course, as Hindu kings, their worldview, their, their articulation of power was couched in Sanskritic Brahminical vocabularies. But that doesn't mean that, that that's all they were. For example, Bukka, who's one of the founders of Vijayanagar, he again describes himself, like Shivaji many centuries later, as Krishna reborn to deliver the earth from the Mlechas, which is the Muslims. But in reality, he was negotiating with uh, Feroz Shah Tughlaq, saying, why don't you come down from the north, and I'll start from the south, and we'll eat the Bahmani sultans for breakfast. So, you know, this is Bukka, who's one of the founders. Harihara and Bukka themselves, according to one very popular enduring theory, they were converted to Islam, and then they reconverted to Hinduism. So even they had a sort of Islamic tradition. In 1352, you find the Vijayanagar kings acquiring this new fancy title, where for the first time, the word Hindu is taken from uh, travelers and foreigners and applied to themselves, where they call themselves Hinduraya Suratrana, which is sultans among Hindu kings. Now, it's a fascinating title because on the one hand, they're calling themselves sultans because that's how all the new great kings are calling. So you have the Kapaya Nayaka, another ruler, calling himself Andhra Suratrana, Sultan of the Andhras. Vijayanagar becomes, you know, Hinduraya Suratrana. They go one step further. Ramaraya calls himself Gola Suratrana, Sultan of the world. So the word sultan comes to mean something even for the kings of Vijayanagar. And if you look, if you go to Tirupati, there's, a, there's a, this famous bronze of Krishna Devaraya there. And he's wearing a hat in it. It's one of those Turkish Persian hats. Because Vijayanagar started absorbing cultural influences from so many places. You know, their artillerymen would come off from Turkey and you know, the Ottoman Empire. There were, there were white people coming in there. There were Persian diplomats. Vijayanagar's own diplomats to the, to the Persian Shah's court were Iranian in origin. Uh, even if you, if you look at the sculptures and the sort of uh, evidence that survives in Hampi today, in the early phase, you find that they're wearing regular South Indian clothes, you know, the, the Munda or the Veshti or whatever you call it. And then as time passes, you find lots of Western Persian influences coming in tunics and shirts and these hats and so on. So that by the end of the by the time Vijayanagar fell, it was a multicultural space where there were so many influences, whether it was this title of Sultan that they carried and flaunted very proudly, or even in the clothes they were wearing, or even a Krishna Devaraya, who arguably was the most popular of and the most important of Vijayanagar kings, even in the way he dressed himself, there were multiple influences. So while Vijayanagar, it's very convenient to paint it as this Hindu empire, yes, it did articulate itself and see itself as uh, through a Hindu prism. But it wasn't merely a Hindu empire. It had right. plenty of Muslims. And it, at one point, uh, it even allowed Muslims to eat beef, much to the regret of Brahmins at court. Yeah, sure. So just a convenient sort of way to reposition it today, Dr. Tharoor? Yeah, I mean, I actually think the book is a very, very good reclaiming 
of, uh, of the arguments for Indian diversity and pluralism. Because you're seeing in Vijayanagar, all these things he talks about much more in the book, which actually reflect the kind of diversity and cosmopolitanism that we have failed to add. We, we, there is a tendency to see cosmopolitanism as something that's come with the British or post-British con uh, conquest. Far from it. We were a globally cosmopolitan society in Vijayanagar and arguably elsewhere before Bombay was ever a port or before uh, Calcutta or Madras had become British uh, settlements. And that cosmopolitanism in Vijayanagar is very well captured through travelers from the Islamic world showing up there and reacting with awe and wonderment. And that in itself, I think, is LSE. I'm sure that some of the sources, the non-Indian sources, particularly travelers, uh, must have been particularly edifying in that regard because you saw an Indian empire through the eyes of people who were then foreigners and who themselves recognized so much. They were astonished. So you have a sentence about this chap being astonished by the paleness of the women in the harem yeah. in Vijayagra. I mean, the thing is that because they were essentially white folks there too. Uh, that was pretty cosmopolitan when you had white women in your harem. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, <laughs> daughters of the snow and not just daughters of the sun. <laughs> I mean. But the fact is that that kind of uh, diversity was just taken for granted after a while. And today, or for a while yesterday, we forgot that. And we tried to paint all of these empires in much uh, more black and white colors, which also actually narrowed and undermined and diluted what they actually were and represented. Vijayanagar, in fact, even made an offer to the king of Portugal, saying, send me a daughter and I'll send you one, and then we'll, we'll form an alliance. And, and you can, I don't know, picture the possibilities. Vijayanagar, yeah. this mighty force on, 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 on the, on, in the country, in the peninsula. And the richest country in the world. And the richest uh, country, one of the biggest capitals at the time, one of the biggest cities. And the Portuguese, with their power at sea, it was a strategic alliance that the Vijayanagar uh, emperor was proposing. And Sanjay Subramaniam is the one who discovered this letter in the Portuguese records. And it's fascinating to think that Vijayanagar would even make such an but offer. But the Portuguese never replied, right? They didn't. <laughs> because for them, the idea of sending a Catholic princess to India was a, to a pagan was a little horrifying. Well, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of this book. And when you read it, you will find many, many more such stories and details. But we have run out of time for this evening. So I would like to... Um, open the session, the question and answer session. Please keep your questions simple and uh, you know, direct and uh, so that we have as many people asking questions as possible. Uh, yes, the young man right there in the middle. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sahil Sagar and I'm currently yes. a student of humanities in 11th standard. Um, so I'm flying all the way from Singapore to see you both. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is actually uh, very current. How you both perceive Islamism of today? Because there have been too much brutal Islamism and Hinduism in your book. To my mind, you mustn't confuse the terms. Islamism is a political term that specifically characterizes a certain subset of Islamic belief. Nothing more to add, just that uh, it's, not mere, it's not only Islam. Even in other religions, you do have people who would prefer a much more extreme a uh, variant of it, often a perversion of the religion itself, which sadly is, you know, a mark of our times, which hopefully books like this will combat. Thank you. N uh, another question? R no? Yes, right There's here. A female voice here. Yes. Uh, I'm Sanya, and I'm currently doing my undergraduation from Japan in international relations. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, I read your book, Riot, a love story, uh, 2000, th th that, that was published in 2005, and it was talking about a uh, riot in 1989. So um, what made you talk about history, keeping a love story in mind that's like not exactly you, unlike your other 16 uh, the, the subtitle, A Love Story, was not in my book. That was tossed in by the American publishers. They probably felt they couldn't sell a book about an Indian riot without <laughs> adding that subtitle. The Indian edition does not carry that subtitle. But, you know, um, what I wanted to do was actually in that novel, um, which is finally soon to be a motion picture, so you'll actually get to watch it in a couple of years, I hope. Um, what I tried to do in that novel was actually use the framework of a love story and the death of someone in a riot to actually uh, trace a number of collisions, a collision of cultures, a collision of values, a collision of, of, uh, of religious uh, identities, a collision of political ideologies, all in the framework of a particular moment in our history 
which was the lead up to what became eventually the destruction of the Babri Masjid. This was the era of the Ram Shila Pujan. And in that, in that period, a riot actually occurred that happened to have been managed or dealt with by a district magistrate who was a close friend and classmate of mine. And he wrote up the account, which he subsequently published in his own book. But he gave me his notes so that I could reinvent and reimagine it within the credible parameters of how a real riot was really managed at that time. So the riot is very realistic because it's based on something that actually happened. All the characters, the issues, the dialogue, everything else is my imagination, including the love story. But the larger thing about the, about the book uh, is to look at the, because all violence is about human beings clashing with other human beings. And, um, and you know, the kinds of collisions we have between Hindu and Muslim in some case, or between RSS and, and, and Congress on the other, or between uh, um, uh, various kinds of ideologies depicted in that book, are then balanced by people uh, with different religions coming across as well and meeting on other kinds of contested terrain, including that of their bodies. Yes, please. My question is to both of you. When you're writing a book on history, how do you keep it only to history and it does not become, you know, a narration of the heritage? The heritage as in? Uh, heritage, you know, is like a fixed thing, but history is dynamic. A new paper can change history. A new research can change history. But heritage remains what it is. It will never change. Well, heritage is sort of interpreted through yeah, you know, so evolving history. How does history. one you know, distinguish and by, while writing a book? That I'm, I'm into history, not a chronological, anecdotal narration of the heritage. You, I suppose you start developing your own definition of heritage based on what history provides. For example, you know, heritage would then involve, for example, a lot of the, the architectural stru structures that remain even now. But they teach you a lot as well. So when you combine your textual sources, you combine your anecdotal evidence with what you can physically see even now in Humpy, for example, it gives you a complete picture. So it wouldn't be easy to divorce one from the other because the two are sort of intrinsically wedded to each other and each informs an understanding of the other. So without uh, looking at physical hard ev heritage as it exists today, we won't really be able to fully grasp history and we can't fully grasp heritage either without understanding history. So the two are linked very closely to each other. I agree with that. I'll add one sentence, uh, not too much, I don't want to repeat all that I said earlier, which is that you mustn't forget that what's written today even about yesterday, is a reflection of today in many ways. And that even if you don't consciously draw that conclusion, you are writing for today's readers with today's sensibilities and today's concerns in your mind, either the back of your mind or the forefront of your mind, that's, your, that's up to the individual historian or writer. And a lot of popular history in particular is bound to reflect those concerns and biases because the writer is conscious that he's reaching a readership today that is influenced by the currents and perceptions of the time. So I think that whether Manu will admit it or not, there is a conscious pushback against the received wisdom or lack thereof about the Deccan and about uh, these empires and about the clashes he talks about. Um, I mean, one of the scholars he cites, a professor called Eaton, for example, I've, I've cited in Era of Darkness in the context of the argument that, that the whole notion that when Muslims came and when Muslim kings came and destroyed Hindu temples, that was a purely sort of anti-Hindu act. And Eaton argues that it's nothing like that. It's merely a phenomenon of the expanding frontier. That a temple was very often the symbol of the kingship of the person you were attempting to defeat or conquer. So when you assaulted his temple, you were assaulting his legitimacy and sovereignty and his standing in the eyes of his own people. Therefore, you attacked the temple. And you had no problem with being rebuilt when you were in charge. But the other problem with all of these uh, things is you simply see the fact of a Muslim king coming and destroying a Hindu temple, and you draw a conclusion. Whereas if you look at it in this larger context of the expanding frontier, and you find there are examples of Hindu kings destroying the Hindu temples of rival Hindu kings when they were defeating them, then you realize that history is a little more complicated. And that today, you will make this argument. Uh, and be conscious that you are making a case for diversity in a land where many, many mentalities are divided uh, on religious identitarian lines. 
How can you not be aware of it? I'm sure Manu was aware of it. And Hindu kings often also stole idols in the sense that Krishna Devaraya, for example, not only when he defeated the king of Orissa, there was a very important temple that mattered to the king of Orissa. He picked up the deity from then, came in and installed this particular god in, in Vijayanagar, in Hampi. Similarly, Pandarpur, the famous idol in Pandarpur, was also carted off to Vijayanagar, and it was eventually returned to Pandarpur uh, by, a, by a saint and mystic and so on. So kings often did also, even Hindu kings, if they didn't always destroy temples, they often did want to appropriate those uh, deities which mattered to their rival kings. I think on those really wonderful and excellent thoughts, we'll wrap up this evening. You can buy Manu's book uh, behind, ask him to sign it for you, continue the conversation with him behind. But thank you so much, gentlemen, and for being here. Thank you, Ira, who, by the way, as many of you might know, is the author of a wonderful book on another neglected chapter in Indian history, Mughal Women, from the time they were riding horses and negotiating treaties and protecting the men. And thank you for being here, Ira, and for being such a wonderful moderator. Thank you Thanks. for having me. Thank you, Dr. Saru, as well. My pleasure, and keep it up, man. Looking forward Thank to you. the next one. Thank you. Thank you all.